Help support the Candid Frame in bringing you awesome conversations with great photographers. You can do this by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. That modest donation helps us to bring a quality show to you every week. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. This is Ibari and X, and this is The Candid Frame. Harvey Stein is a committed photographer. Not only has he practiced his personal approach to street and documentary photography for decades, but he's also been very purposeful about it. During his lengthy career, he's dedicated much of his time to returning to certain locations over and over again, whether it's Coney Island, Harlem, India, or Mexico. Harvey has used his growing and evolving familiarity with the place to inform his photography. His frequent use of an ultra-wide angle lens is a purposeful one, as it allows him to create an important relationship between the people and their community. I like getting close and getting uh, the context in which the people are located. I like um, not just doing a face or maybe head and shoulders. I like the environment. I want a context. I want to put them in a place uh, and usually where I find them. I might move them around a little bit. I might tell, I tell them often where to look. I might guide them a little bit. And so my, again, my approach is to get close, not be candid. I like to go up to people and interact with them, talk with them, uh, um, and guide them a little bit, not boss them around. And so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm unlike the tires in the sense that I try to control the street rather than letting it control me. These long-term projects have resulted in numerous books. His latest is Mexico, Between Life and Death, and is the culmination of 14 trips made between 1993 and 2010. In these trips, he documented cultural events in large towns and small villages and explored the people's relationship with rituals tied to death, myth, and religion. For Harvey, it's not the rituals and ceremony that provide the inspiration for his photographs, but the intimacy he finds with the place and its people. I, f I make new discoveries, so I think I want to get a certain amount of depth uh, it, it, um, into my photographs that I can only achieve by going many times. So if someone goes once or twice, yeah, maybe they'll like it and maybe they'll, they'll get a couple good images, but it can't compare to going back 20, 30, 40 times and getting to know your subject. Even if you're bored with it, that's okay. When we're bored, that means I'm not working hard enough or I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just not working well enough, hard enough or well enough, because it's not about only the place that I'm photographing, it's the people. We'll talk to Harvey about his lengthy career and how film provides him an advantage that he feels wouldn't be possible when using digital. Welcome to The Candid Frame. Well, Harvey, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a pleasure to have you and have a chance to sit down and talk with you again. Thank you. I really had a, enjoyed uh, meeting you and having a chance to see you talk about your work when I was at the Miami Street Photography Festival last year. Did you hear my talk? Yeah, yeah, it was great fun. That was two years ago. Was it two years ago now? Yeah, and, I'm, and I was there last year and I did a workshop there. Oh, I okay. Gave, gave a talk two years ago. Okay. Then I think I think I saw the video that was done on uh, on YouTube that they had posted. Okay. But in any case, well, welcome to the show, and thank you for sending, sending me a copy of your latest book. One of the more interesting things uh, about the work that you did in Mexico was the fact that you shot a lot at night, and I think that a lot of people, when they think of street photography, they often think of photography done in broad daylight. It's something that not a lot of people take advantage of. Um, right. Th tell me about why, especially in Mexico, you had an interest in photographing there in the evening. Well, 
It's a pretty simple answer, I think, and that's because the events that I was photographing were occurring in the evening. Typically, I, I would say I don't photograph that much at night on the street because of a lot of logistical issues, because maybe I'm tired at night. Like in New York, I don't shoot that much at night. But in Mexico, I photograph Day of the Dead. So that happens at night. That happens in cemeteries where the mostly indigenous people will visit the grave sites of their ancestors or, or, or the, of their family, of their loved ones. And they'll, they'll clean the grave sites. They'll paint it, repaint it. They'll put flowers and food, their favorite, their ancestors' favorite flowers and food and photographs of them. And then they sit there the evening of, I think it's November 1st, All Saints Day, into the evening and sit there all night and ca with candlelight. So that's one event, quote unquote, I photographed it, that has to be done at night. I photographed Semana Santa in Tosco, uh, and they have religious processions the whole week. Semana Santa is Holy Week, and it's the week between... Um, that leads up to Easter, so five or six days before Easter, culminates in Easter. Good Friday is the Friday before Easter. And the, those four or five days before Good Friday, even like Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, not Friday, but Thursday night. Uh, in Tosco, they have these amazing religious processionals, different every night, and it happens at night. So I'm photographing there at night. I like photographing at night. I've always photographed at night somewhat, but in Mexico, when I go to these events uh, and, and I'm there for that specific event and maybe that week or two, I'm usually shooting at night. But I'm also, during the day, there's things going on like uh, at, at the churches or in front of the churches that I'm photographing also. So I would say, yeah. Uh, another thing is I, I find Mexico magical and a little mysterious. And I think the night adds to it. You're never exactly sure of what you're seeing at night. You're shrouded, it's dark. And so it, it I think for me, heightens my, my sense of mystery and sense of magic and maybe even death, if I could use that mm -hmm. word. Like night's falling and, and, and our, our days are, are ending and, and, and we, it, it all becomes dark. So I do use flash. Occasionally, I I I, I shoot without the without flash. All of this is film. I'm shooting at, at 100 ISO. Uh, I'm shooting M with M4s, like is with slow lenses. They're, the camera's 40, 50 years old. The lenses are 40 or 50 years old. So I'm shooting at f 2.8, f 3.4. I don't have super fast lenses. And I'm shooting at 100 ISO because that's the film I know and that's what I shoot during the day and I don't adjust for the night. I rely on the flash. I guess that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to uh, see that camera and took a photograph of it. And, oh, and uh, some people have talked about a camera being battle-worn. They hadn't seen yours. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I have two of them. Unfortunately, one of them got stolen this past June. Oh, that's it was terrible. Really beat up. And I'm trying to replace it with a new, another M4 on from eBay or whatever. And I, I'm having trouble finding what I want. Yeah, I still have one old M4 that I've had for 40 years. I, I shoot digitally. I mean, I have a 5D. I have, a, I have a, probably an eight-year-old 5D. Mm -hmm. So I shoot digitally, but I still prefer film, and I'd much rather shoot film. I, I just love film, and I feel more comfortable shooting film. And I love these small cameras compared to the 5D. And, the, and I, I only shoot wide angle. So uh, my long lens is a 35 millimeter. I never shoot beyond a 35 millimeter as far as the lens. My My... Go-to lens is uh, a 21 millimeter, and I'd say 80 to 85% of all my production in black and white is with that 21 millimeter. How did you come to favor, favor that lens? I had a teacher, my first teacher, Ben, ben Fernandez, ben, Benedict Fernandez, a rough and tough guy from the South Bronx, 
in New York City. And I took a class with him in 1971, maybe 72. I heard him speak. And he was a real well-known street photographer then doing uh, anti-war work. And uh, I took a class with him. And he said three things. Get a Leica, get a 21-millimeter lens, and go to Coney Island and photograph. And being the good little student that I was then, I did all three, and I'm still doing it. So <laughs> I've done two books on Coney Island, and I'm working on a third one, 50 years. The title is Coney Island, 50 years, and that should come out in a couple of years. So he, he was very influential with me. Uh, I hung out with him. I used his dark room in his home in New Jersey for about six months until I was able to get my dark room going. And uh, I was pretty close with him. And then I, so I started, I got it. It would cost $300 then, you know, it's 21 millimeter, which was a lot of money. I got a Leica. I got a used Leica. I got a used M4. I got a used 21 millimeter, super angular on 3.4. So I, I got that camera and lens and, and did go to Coney Island and started my love affair with Coney Island and produced, I'm so forth, produced two books. And I liked what I was getting. That was the important thing. So when I shoot with a 21, it forces me to get close. It forces me to get five feet or closer, three to five, six, seven feet. If you're beyond that distance, your pictures aren't going to be really successful. It's not going to work because it, the lens pushes space back. I like the results. I liked uh, getting close. I like the distortion. I like the vignetting. The 21 super angular tends to in vignette the edges a little bit. Uh, I just like the look. And so uh, from day one, I, I photographed people with that. I did a book on identical twins that came out. My first book came out in 1978. And I'd, I did 150-some identical twins. And I'd say 150 out of the 155 or six photographs were with wide angle, what were with wide angle with a 21 millimeter lens. Yeah. I like getting close and getting the context in which the people are located. I like not just doing a face or maybe head and shoulders. I like the environment. I want a context. I want to put them in a place. And usually where I find them, I might move them around a little bit. I might tell, I tell them often where to look. I might guide them a little bit. And so, my again, my approach is to get close, not be candid. I like to go up to people and interact with them, talk with them, and guide them a little bit, not boss them around. And so I'm trying to I'm, – I'm unlike the tires in the sense that I try to control the street rather than letting it control me. I don't love candid – I like candid street photography. I don't like doing it. I'm not a Cartier Bresson. I'm not as good as he is. So what I call my approach is a confrontational collaborative, mm -hmm. confrontational slash collaborative, where I'm confronting them in the sense that I'm going up to them, I'm in their space, and I'm speaking to them. And then, so that's the collaborative. And then confrontational, where I'm, I'm three feet away, and I'm asking them to usually look into the camera not at me, but into the camera, and to not smile. So I don't say don't smile. I, can, I say, can you be serious? I think that makes, at least for me, a stronger image. I don't want them smiling. Smiling is a mask. It's, a, it's bullshit for the camera. It's like, oh, I look better. I'm trying to please you. I want them to be serious and strong looking, and I, that results for me in a strong image. You mentioned with the 21 millimeter about getting close and that you have to get close for a good composition. But one of the right. other things that 21 does, and you just mentioned it, is that it is much more inclusive of the, the background um, and a bunch of different elements. And it can be really difficult to effectively create a, a, a photograph in that way. When you're composing your shots, what kinds of considerations are you making to the stuff that's immediately behind your subject and at the edges of your frame? Well, I've trained myself. I think I'm pretty good at looking beyond my subject. So I, I don't want uh, a lot of clutter in the back. I want a, some kind of organization and maybe a, a, 
a graphic element in the, in the back. Uh, I don't want the subject's head to be, you know, uh, or a tree or, I mean, this is the cliche. I don't want a tree coming out of a shoulder or a head. So I can move around quickly. I look beyond just the subject and, and I'm looking for composition also. So I'm close to the person. So I'm interacting and I don't, they're, they're the main, they're there in the spotlight. They're the main reason I'm photographing. And if the background isn't good, I'll probably still take the photograph, but I might, I'll move or I'll move them by a good background. It could be a wall. It could be a blank wall, but I prefer a person over to the left, a car to the right, a, a dog. I like, I like a lot of, um, commotion in a way, but organized, organized so that the main subject still is the main subject and isn't interfered with. The other thing that I like about the wide angle lens is I get a lot of depth of field. I would lo I love to shoot at, at like F11 at 125th of a second. That's with a hundred ISO film. That would be uh, in sunlight. My depth of field is three feet to infinity and I do hyperfocal distance focusing. Um, I'm at inf I put the infinity mark at, uh, on, on the depth of field scale at like F11, and, and I can get depth of field from three feet to infinity. If I'm at five, six, I can get infinity to six feet maybe with a 21. So I want detail. I want information. I like photographs where it's just a face and then everything is blurred. But that's not for me. I, I like it less than what I do, of course. Otherwise, I would be doing that. And that is maximum information, maximum detail. If the background goes a little soft way in the back, fine. But usually, because I'm at an infinity, a focus of infinity to three, four, five feet, I get everything in focus. So that could mean clutter and confusion, which occasionally happens, and sometimes that works. But I, I work quickly. I scan my, my frame uh, or my uh, vision of uh, view uh, pretty well, and I see what's happening. I'll wait. I'll, if, I, if I'm doing a portrait of someone on the street, I'll wait till the background element uh, isn't this cluttered, like someone's walking by. I, I'll make sure they're in the place that I want them to be or not there at all. They're not going to be behind, directly behind my subject. So for a lot of reasons, I really have always shot with a 21. And I, I say that I miss shots maybe with a, a 50 or a 90. I do shoot with a 35 millimeter wide angle occasionally. I, I have two cam Leicas. One, I carry two Leicas usually with me, a 35 millimeter, which I use 10 or 15 percent of the time, and the 21, which is my main, my main lens. And I... I think I have a unique style in a way. I mean, I've always thought my pictures are a little different because of the wide angleness and the closeness that I, I tend to achieve. And, and the fact that a lot of my pictures have people looking into the lens on the street. I engage people. Yeah. Maybe not as much as I would like to in the Mexico book because I, I don't speak the language. I can... I'll go up to people, I'll nod, I'll, I know, the, I know uh, por favor and una photo, <laughs> por favor, and that get, that's enough. I think I have a little more candid images in the book than I normally would, like in my Coney Island pictures or my Harlem book. Speaking of, speaking of Harlem and Coney Island and Mexico, like Mexico, you've been going back, I think, about 14 years. Yes. And uh, you mentioned Coney Island from the very beginning. So, right. you know, there are certain parts of, of um, in terms of your images, places that you've returned to over and over again. Right. And how important has that been to be able to return to a space, not just a couple of times during the year, but a span of years? Right. Well, that's, that's a good question. But let me just say before I answer, I'm answering the question. I am answering the question. In Mexico, I go to the same places. I go to the same cities. I'll always go on a trip to a new city because I want to expand my my location and my logistics. But I always go back to the same small villages or small towns or large towns, um, Puebla or even Mexico City. 
And so it's really important for me to go back to the same places because I become familiar with them. I become a little more comfortable with them. I meet people. I get to know some people. Not that they help me particularly, but they don't hurt me. And I, I've even given photographs. Like in Mexico, I go to a Tosco where the religious processions, Semana Santas, uh, I photograph many times. And I've met people and even brought back photographs because I know where they'll be the next year. So it's really important for me. I don't know, psychologically, comfort level. And I, I, that's one of the things I, I kind of talk about to my students. I work in long-term project form. I teach a class in that. I mean, that's what, and my ultimate goal is to turn my long-term projects into books. So now I've done that eight times. My books have, the fastest book that I've done is at six years. So I've had, I have two books that are 40 years. I have a book I'm working on that's going to be 50 years. The Mexico book was 18 years. I want to work over a long period of time to gain knowledge, to gain uh, experience in the subject. I studied twins. My first book, I studied twins. I read about them. I followed them. I went to uh, twin meetings. So I'm trying to immerse myself in my subject. Whether it's local at Coney Island, which happens to be 25 miles away, or it's further away, like India. I've been to India now four times, and I have a major project I'm working on. New Mexico that I've been to 15 times at least, and I have a body of work there. Or Coney Island, which is kind of in my backyard, uh, 25 miles away from my home. Um, so it's really important. So what does that familiarity provide you in terms of, let's say, um, for lack of a better word, advantage to someone who just visits it periodically or on, on vacation? Right. Uh, I think if you're just there once or twice, you might get lucky and get some good pictures, but I don't think you really know it. And I think you would come away saying, oh, gosh, I want to go back. I would like to go back there because I know I, I haven't covered it. I haven't done enough of it. And that's the feeling I get. I mean, I go to Mexico. It's a big country. I mean, how could, and, and I go to Coney Island and it's small. It's like, I don't know, it's not even a mile long. And yes, I'm bored with it. I'm bored with Coney Island going there because, oh my God, I've been there thousands of times. I was just there this past Thursday in 93 degree heat. Mm. Oh my goodness. So I, I make new discoveries. I think I want to get a certain amount of depth into my photographs that I can only achieve by going many times. So if someone goes once or twice, yeah, maybe they'll like it or maybe they'll, they'll get a couple good images, but it can't compare to going back 20, 30, 40 times and getting to know your subject, even if you're bored with it. That's okay. When we're bored, that means I'm not working hard enough or I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just not working well enough, hard enough or well enough, because it's not about only the place that I'm photographing, it's the people. So if I go to one my block on my street, I'm bored with my neighborhood. Of course, we're really bored with our neighborhoods because we know it so well. We see it every day. I hardly photograph in my neighborhoods. But if I forced myself, I'm sure I could get good photographs by working hard and being there. you got to be there. So if you don't return, you're not going to get a body of work. I'm looking for two, three, four hundred photographs. Coney Island, I, I, for my first book, I had thousands of, it was slides. I shot slides. My first book on Coney Island is slides and color, my only color book. I need to be there many, many times to understand what I'm doing. That's another thing. I like when I went to Mexico, what am I shooting? What am I going to shoot? What, what's here? and to try to understand what's there. And then I leave and think about it and then say, wow, I want to go back. And the sooner the better, if I, if I like it. There are places I go to I'd never want to go back to to photograph. Thanks everyone who contributed to TCF after last week's show. 
I've been really touched by your response and your generosity. It really is affirming to know that the work that we do here is making such a difference in your personal and creative lives. It inspires me and my team as we work to improve the quality of the show, as well as our other offerings, including the ebooks, the YouTube channel, and our workshops. Our goal is to reach 100 new Patreon supporters who commit to contribute $5 or more each month. Though it may seem like a really modest amount, that money helps us to invest in the tools and resources we need going forward, like treating our new interview room with audio panels to optimize the sound quality for our in-person interviews. We don't have regular advertisers, and it's been you and your support that has allowed us to make the show what it is today and will be in the future. If the show is making a difference for you, please visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Because you're largely shooting in film, you don't have the immediate feedback that people who shoot digital have. So right. when you're working out in Mexico or Coney Island or, or, or Italy or wherever you are and you're making photographs, right. how are you sort of quantifying what you're what you are doing, you know, whether or not you're covering all the sort of bases that you had intended to do, if you don't have the immediate feedback of being able to look at the, the contact sheets or the images on the screen. Okay, and worse yet, I'm two, three years behind in processing my film. Oh, Maybe wow. five years behind making prints from it. I mean, I'm making prints now of image of film that I process that from 20... 15, 2014, 2013. If I'm working on like a Coney Island project, I'll develop those that film right away. I probably have a thousand roles here that are waiting to be processed. Will I ever get to them? Yeah, I get to them. Maybe in 2020, I'll, I'll get, I'll be finished with 2017, you know. So that even compounds the problem of not knowing what you're getting. I'm sure I leave some pictures unfound, like in my last uh, book that came out in 2015. I have found better pictures maybe subsequently in the last two years that I could have put into that book. It was street photography in New York City, Midtown. I am very patient. I've always liked not seeing what I've shot right away because I, I, I get rid of any strong emotion of the day or what I went through that day. Like I was at Coney Island Thursday, it was 93 degrees. I was hot and miserable. But I know I, I shot five rolls in about three hours. I lasted about three hours. And I'm going to develop that within a month or two, I'm sure. But if it were any other subject, I could wait two years. I don't want to be caught up in the emotionality of that night looking at my pictures and, and, and making choices that based more on emotion than on distance, maybe, and uh, enlightenment or, or smart, uh, being smart about it, if that's the way. Does that make sense? No, it makes know. perfect sense. Um, yeah. You, you, you mentioned that this is one of your, um, did you say sixth book? Eighth book. Eighth book, excuse me. Eighth <laughs> So tell me about the, the process of selecting the images in the book, considering that you'd had the experience seven times before. What I try to do is when I make prints and I think I have a book idea going, I will lay out the photographs as soon as I make them, which could be two years later too. So I'll start, I'll start with eight by 10. I make prints, eight by 10 black and white prints. I put them on a table and I, here's the first photograph, here's the 10th. And we have in between eight more. And I start a sequence, so that's really important. I have it in a box, but I bring it out periodically. And every time I make new prints of that subject, I'll bring out the 10 and I'll add three more because I've made some new prints. And then I'll have 13 and then I'll have 20 and then I'll have 30. And I'll even replace some. Oh, I shot the same thing, but better three months ago. So it's, so I have like a, table of photographs, uh, a, a box of photographs. It, it grows from 10 to 100 to 200, maybe 300. And I'm always editing. So I'm constantly editing as I'm shooting. 
that kind of reinforces me. To, uh, it shows me what I have, what I have too much of, what I don't have enough of, uh, and to go back and shoot. So it's a long process. It's a slow, long process. I have to get into the dark room. I have to make prints. I probably now have 300 Coney Island photographs for my new book, but I'm going to shoot right to the end. I'm going to shoot to 2020, which is 50 years. It'll be 1970 to 2020, and hopefully the book will come out either late 2020 or late or early 2021. And I'll always say, wait, I got to go one more time. I got to go one more time. I don't worry about what I'm missing. I'm not trying to cover everything. Mm-hmm. I can't do everything of Mexico or everything of Coney Island. I repeat, but I try to get the repeats out. I do what I can do. And then I, I, and I feel like if I have 80% of the photographs finished, that's the time I can go to the publisher. Like, I feel comfortable that this is a book. This is good and that someone will want to publish it. I don't wait till I have 100%. So it gives me, let's say, another year to photograph. And I never feel finished, but some time you have to be finished because, you know, what finishes me are, is that my deadline. Like if I sign a contract and say, okay, the book's going to be out in March of 2019, th- then I have to give them the pictures nine months before or, or, or maybe that date for the next nine months of publication. So that's when I am finished. And even when I'm finished, I still shoot the subject, usually. Uh, not every time. Like my, I did a book on twins. So I still photograph twins, but not I'm not looking for that. I still photograph artists. I did a book on painters and sculptors. So that's finished. That was a concrete finished. I'm not, I would go to their studios. I'm not doing that anymore. But Coney Island, I can't let go of. Mexico, I'm sure I'm going back to Mexico. This book is out in 10 days. I'm sure I'm going to go back to Mexico because I love it. It's, a, it's, it's amazing. So I guess I'm off the track somewhere. So when you're, when you're home, what's your routine? How much time do you spend going out and, say, photographing in the streets of New York or Coney Island? And how much is dedicated to creating proof sheets, making prints, so on and so forth? I print a couple times a month in my dark room. It's not my dark room. I share a dark room, so I have to schedule it. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm there from like nine in the morning till nine at night. Uh, and I make about 10 images. I, I work with about 10 negatives for that day. So that's two days, three days a month. I am teaching a day or two a week, probably a di- excuse me, a day a week usually during the winters and spring, not in the summer somewhere. I'm traveling. Uh, I'm doing a lot of my own workshops. I went this year so far to Argentina. I went to New Mexico, each for a week. I'm going to Vietnam for three weeks in October. Last year, I went to India, Greece to do a workshop. So I do three large workshops a year. That's six weeks out of the year. I do short three-day workshops. At home, I'm working on my computer. Um, Well, I'm I'm looking, when I I go into the darkroom, I'm looking at my contact sheets for a day before to prepare. And I have have stacks of contact sheets that I haven't looked at. So I'm always looking at my contact sheets. I'm not looking at my prints that much. I know what I have. But I, they're in a box. But I, when I have new prints, I add to my old sequence, and, and so I'm, I am looking at that. I'm on the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm emailing. I'm spending too much time emailing. I'm trying to arrange workshops, teaching, uh, showing work. You know, I don't know. I, I don't waste time. I, 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 I develop film every other morning. It's six. 30 in the morning I start, 7 this morning I develop from 6.30. takes me an hour and a half, 6.30 to 8 in the morning. Sunday I went to the market. I went to a farmer's market to get some food. I make lunch. I have a wife to take care of a little bit. You know, We have to go out for dinner. We, so uh, I, I photographed yesterday. I'll photograph two or three times a week. I'll go out photographing. And that's could be all day, 
or it could be two or three hours. And I go out when there's certain events that I want to cover that I have gone back to year after year. There was a Labor Day parade. I photographed that on yesterday. Uh, yes, it, was like, it wasn't it was Labor Day yesterday, but they didn't have it Labor Day. They had it yesterday. Uh, today, there's two or three events. It's raining. I'm tired. I'm talking to you, so I'm not going out. I went to the market. But usually on the weekends, I'm photographing. Both I gotta say, I'm, I marvel at your stamina. I'm younger than you are, and uh, and I'm I get exhausted just doing a quarter of the things that you just listed. So, well, what, what's a testament to your to your stamina? I try to take care of myself. I try to keep in shape. I get tired. I probably take a nap here and there, and my on my chair for five minutes if I'm really tired. I love what I do. You know, I love photographing. I love being out. I love seeing people. And anytime I'm out shooting, like an event, yesterday I bumped into two friend, two people that I'm friendly with, two photographers. I don't know. I just like to be out. I, I like a lot. I love New York. I shoot a lot. Mostly I shoot in New York, believe it or not. I have three books that the last three books before Mexico was New York. It was Harlem. It was Midtown. And it was Coney Island. I think uh, five of my books are based in New York. This 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 might be a Mexico book might be a surprise to people. I'm thought of as a New York photographer, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I've been to, I have so much work from India. I have I have so much work from New Mexico that's never seen the light of day. It'll never see the light of day. I'm going to run out of time, and that that's an issue. And I guess I worry about that. But I try to. I try to pace myself and I try to keep in good condition. I don't drink coffee. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't eat meat. And I, I feel good. I mean, I'm lucky, I guess, so far. <laughs> in New York, um, what neighborhoods do you favor and how have you see, seen it change uh, during the many years that you photographed there? Right. I see. I, I, I don't like the change. It, it has changed a lot. It's harder to find fun, what I call funky places, funky, downtrodden, a little poor, a little offbeat. Everywhere is not, it's nice and safe. I don't mind going into unsafe neighborhoods during the day with a camera. Maybe I'll go with someone. I've never had a problem. Soho was difficult in the 70s. Uh, the East Village was terrible. Now it's beautiful. It's so nice. Brooklyn, parts of Brooklyn, Harlem. I spent from 1990 to 2010 uh, shooting in Harlem. I was totally welcome. It's, you know, it's nice. Everything's nice now in New York. So it's really gentrified to the point that it's not that interesting. So I, I'm going out to the um, boroughs now. I, I just photographed an, an event, uh, an Ecuadorian parade. I'd never photographed that before. That was great. In Queen, graphed in the Bronx, a uh, um, Puerto Rican street party. Never had done that before. So I want to go further afield than Manhattan or even Brooklyn. Oh, I just did uh, in Crown Heights, which is a very, it's a black neighborhood, but it's turning and there's a lot of white people around now, but fabulous. Uh, a children's parade. And then I photographed the Caribbean parade. West Indie Parade, which was so amazing with all the costumes. I'm not interested in the parade. When I go to these events, I'm not interested in the parade um, or the costumes. I'm interested in the people. And I do the periphery of the parades where people are hanging out. So there's people out, and it gives me permission with a camera to be there and to and everyone has cameras now, so it's so much easier to approach people during these events. I'll go out with a camera and just walk around. I did that on last Thursday at Coney Island. Nothing's happening. It was really quiet. It was hot. It was earlier in the day, but I managed to photograph five roles. But New York is changing, and I feel it's harder to photograph here like I, I used to. Maybe I'm slowing down. I certainly am. But... It's not as vibrant. The street life isn't as vibrant. It's maybe more hom homogeneous, like most cities are. But there's still great people and characters and craziness going on on the streets. There's, there's enough, but maybe you have to f search a little more for it. 
it doesn't hit you in the face like it, it did in the 70s where there was garbage everywhere and bad drugs and stuff. You don't see that. I don't see that. It's, it, it's harder and it's more difficult. And that's why I like India is incredible. It's like another planet. Vietnam is beautiful and the people are so welcoming and, and it's so different. So I, I need that stimulation. But New York stimulates me also, but more in a more in a way that I'm more used to. It's not as exciting visually to me anymore. And one reason maybe too, because I'm, I've been here. I moved here in 19... 19- 65, I think. I'm a New Yorker now. I'm from Pittsburgh. I like going back to Pittsburgh. I like to. I like going to other cities to photograph. I was in London, Paris. I don't like, you know, going to Europe. It's. I. I, I did a book on Italy. I. I have a book on Italy that I shot for t- ten years. Uh, it came out in 2006. 2006. So, but Italy and all of. Europe is pretty much like America. I'm going, I'm doing a workshop next, next April to China. I'm worried, oh God, is it going to be, we're going to go to Beijing, we're going to go to Shanghai. Is it going to be like just high rises? Probably not because the person that is guiding me and us, the workshop who I'm using to help me with it, swears that we'll go to villages and all this kind of stuff. But New York... Yeah. As you, as you mentioned, you do a lot of teaching. And yes. you know, so you have students from various experience levels. What's what's the thing that you what's the biggest mistake that you think that a lot of them make and what's the the biggest piece of advice that you give them? The biggest mistake they make is they don't work hard enough. They probably don't take it seriously enough. I teach intermediate students. I, I some of them go on to be more involved let's say uh they think it's easy it's not they don't work on uh projects that compels them uh not many some do the biggest mistake is they use long lenses they're too much into immediate feedback and reward and if they don't get that they sort of lose interest there's a lot of mistakes they make <laughs> but yet they you know, like, I love teaching the workshops. I teach at ICP, International Center of Photography, and I've taught there since 1976. I missed one year because I taught at RIT for a couple of years in, in Rochester, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. They, um, they don't want to put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. I think there's a very small minority of the students that do, and, they, and maybe they become photographers. It's a hard way to make a living, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's hard to, and I think it's hard for people, not just people who are young, but anyone in, like, at least at least in this country, who's so impatient, so right. impatient to take on a practice that demands patience as just part of that creative process. Right. They want feed, they want immediate gratification. And I think if you get a little pat on the back here or there, and that's what I got, and I got published pretty quickly, uh, it, it, it helps. It helps you feel good and want to make more. I think most of them lack passion for it. Uh, there, There's a lot to do in this world. There's a lot of um, things that one can do. And with digital, with, you know, the Internet and all that, you know, we're caught up in our work. I did a workshop just uh, in August, this past August, in New Mexico, two of the people were doctors, two women, one an ER doctor, and she was like 38, and the other woman, a specialist, and she's about 50 or so. They love photography, but they can't do it full time, and rightly so, I guess. They don't want to give up their profession. So I don't know that we're producing many wonderful or terrific full t- I get there there always will be but and we graduate a lot of people I think uh, most f- graduate photographers aren't photo- after five years aren't photographers anymore they're, or they're not shooters maybe yeah. they go into uh, ga- gallery work or museum or uh, in the old days they they worked at labs you know and they were printers or something 
or they become assistants for five, four or five years, but they don't, they, they fall by the wayside. I see great work in some classes, but I know, or I feel I want to see that in five years. And I feel I won't because they can't sustain it. Mm. They don't have the motivation. So yeah, when they're in school and they're getting instruction and they have people around them, uh, st other students that help them and spur them on and they can share but when you're working alone, photography is an alone business. You're working alone. Uh, you're in the dark, or you're at your 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 um, you know printer at home in your office. You're out shooting. You're out shooting alone usually. Maybe you're shooting on the street and meeting people, but you're 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 walking around alone. You're traveling. When I travel, I often travel alone. I like to travel with other people. I shoot a lot during my workshops, and I like that. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. And the feedback, where do you get the feedback these days? Yeah. Where, what galleries? What what uh, museums? What magazines? Yeah, there's online maybe, but it's kind of a silent feedback. <laughs> if someone does a blog of you uh, on their blog, publish you on their blog, it's, you know, you don't even meet the people. Here we're meeting at least, you know, we're talking. It's pretty alone business. So I don't know that many, that people, I don't know. I just feel the big mistake is not sticking to it long enough. And maybe you can't because you have to feed yourself and you're not feeding yourself through photography. Yeah. When I started, I did it. I, I have a, I have a, a MBA. I have a Bachelor of Science degree. I have an MBA. When I started, I was working. I did my first book, the twins book, Parallels of Lucky Twins, while I was working full time. I was dedicated not to my job, but to photography. I was just starting. Uh, I don't didn't have a formal education. I had a business education that I didn't like, and I was working in the corporate world. And I wanted, I was looking, searching. I tried to paint. I tried to write. I did ceramics. I picked up a camera. I said, wow, I, I, this is for me. I knew right away. And it took me five, six years, from my first five or six years shooting, to get to the point where I could quit work. I came out with the book, and then I quit work, and I became a full-time photographer. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, okay. someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. I have a person for you, and I want you to interview her. Okay. This woman is the best photographer I know right now. She is incredible. She's from Greece. She lives in London now. She's traveled the world. Uh, she was a student of mine in 2011, uh, and she has grown and grown and grown. She's won prizes in Europe. She, she's lived all over the world. Her husband is the Greek ambassador to Britain, and he was the assistant, the second ambassador to the UN for Greece here in New York, and that's where I met her mm. in 2011. Her name is Margarita Mavro Mikolas, M A V R O M I C H A L I S. Her work is stunning. She's fearless. <laughs> she's, uh, it's, I, it's indescribable, I think. She's on Instagram. Her website is incredible, I think. And she says, and the best thing about her, probably, is that she's so. She doesn't know that she's so unaware of how good she is. Only, and she's not confident in like, I shouldn't say this. She'll be pissed at me. But <laughs> she would not speak about her work. She would not give a talk. I finally got her to talk uh, at, at a professional organ, a photo organization here. And she, once she starts talking, she's spellbinding. So I, I and I was going to tell you to look her up. Well, you you piqued my interest most definitely, so I, I will do that. I hope you uh, you will uh, check her out at least. And uh, Bob has met her. Bob, I I talked to Bob recently. I introduced her to Bob, and he said she she's his favorite photographer. Right? Yeah, the Bob Patterson of uh, Street Photography Magazine. So. People look her up and uh, uh, Mavro Nicholas, and she's on Instagram, and um, I think you'll be pleased. I'll be, 
Thank you so much, Harvey. I really appreciate you making time for me on this Sunday Sunday morning. And um, and congratulations on the book. Thank you. The book is published by Career Verlag. They're in Germany. Uh, it'll be at, at Amazon. It's on my uh, website, which I hope we'll put on there. And I'm selling books personally also. So if you want a signed, inscribed book, let me know. And I could we could talk or eat through email, I could send you a book and and you could send me $45 and you'd have a beautiful book. Uh, I think I do think it's my strongest book to date. Of course, everyone thinks that of the latest work, but it's the most beautiful book I think I've had published. Yeah, and I have links for all of that in in the in the show notes. And having seen the PDF, I can I can agree that it is a stellar, stellar book. So congrats. Thank you. Thanks to Harvey for spending time with us. Check out his work by visiting his website at harveysteinphoto.com. And I've also recently released two books. The first is an ebook, Lessons from the Street. It's about some of the bigger mistakes that I've made as a photographer and some of the valuable lessons that I learned that have helped improve my photography. It's just $7 and you can purchase it directly from the website. And my follow-up to my first book, Chasing the Light, is now available for purchase. It's called Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, and teaches you how to create better photographs more consistently, and more importantly, teaches you how to become your own best editor. You can order and download the ebook version right now, or place a pre-order for the soft cover, which comes out in December. When you place your order from the Rocky Nook Publisher website, make sure to use the code PORELLO40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website and the show notes for the link. And after you read it, please write a review in the Amazon store, whether or not you bought it from there or not. It's a critical component of my effort to promote and market the book. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. We also love the reviews people write about us in the iTunes store, and I always make it a point of acknowledging them as they come in from all over the world. Thanks to Bisman Japan for his five-star review. And as I said earlier, you can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. Thanks to Sanjay Vizianathan, Raphael De La Uz, Dave Rosenblum, Bob Fisher, Dotan Zagai, James Haywood, Mark Osler, Constance Bauer, Nick Tauro, Jacint Juhaz, Jean-Marc Barra, Damini Brown, Bijan Sabe, Tim Herencar, and Rod Coots for their recent contributions. You people are awesome. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. Download it today. You'll find it where everything else is in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at eBodyNX. And this is eBodyNX, and this is The Candid Frame.